Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Maddie B. And it's going to be a hot show today. I know normally we start with the NFL, but there's something that's just been annoying the crap out of me all weekend. So it's going to be college football at the top. So for the Steeler ones, still undefeated. Big win over the Jaguars. We're going to be getting into that in a little bit. But I got to get this off my chest. Dabo Sweeney is just going after Florida State. And I don't know why. So I know people why, that, they've been laying the lumber to him for the last 30 years. The people that just read the headline, because I think that that's what the issue is, people are just reading the headline and they think, well, Florida State's at fault. Because Clemson is coming out so hard in defense of this, it boggles my mind. So Clemson had a player that was sick last week. They, they practiced the entire week. They knew he had symptoms, whatever. They gave them the coronavirus test on Friday. Didn't wait for the results. And mind you, this is the thing that annoys me. Matt, they're so close. They could have just flew on the day of the game. Like I know it was a nooner. They could have flew in at like 7 in the morning and been fine. Like they, that was like a, it's not even a really a day drive. I don't even know how many hours it is, but that's a close game. So for him saying like, oh, we did everything we had, we could do. We followed the ACC protocol. The protocol, I mean, he exposed the entire team by having this guy travel with him in the plane. And I know there's been some science saying maybe it doesn't spread on the plane because of all the, the airflow stuff they have there. It doesn't matter. Because what was it, Notre Dame that had the issue where everyone got sick at the buffet? Like, you still knew this guy was sick. In, instead of, I just don't understand why they didn't wait. All of these schools and all of these states are letting people play. I think even the governor of Michigan said, hey, we're going to keep these people playing because they can do the rapid tests. And, and yeah. just wait. Like, you knew he was sick. I don't understand why they had to hop on the flight get down there, get the positive result. I mean, was it not ready until Saturday? Like, I don't know. I don't understand the timeline at all. And so it just, off the bat, I knew, okay, this is going to be a crazy call that they canceled the game on Saturday morning. And then immediately Clemson came out complaining about it. But if I was Florida State, and if you look around the country, and how everyone's hospitals are now getting overrun. Do you really need to be diverting resources to college football at this time? No. If it was a month ago, and cases, I mean, they were, they've been increasing, but it, it wasn't a strain on the hospital that it is right now. So it's very tone deaf for Davos Mini to just come out and think that Clemson is above everything else. And to be honest, there's been a lot more Clemson fans popping out. Where did they come from? Because it, it wasn't even a decade ago when Steve Spurrier was whooping that ass and you didn't find a Clemson fan anywhere. Anywhere. And, and they even had some decent players. That was whenever uh, West Virginia was running the score up in the, one of their bowl games. That was like Dabo's sixth or seventh year. People keep saying, well, Harbaugh is nothing. Like Dabo was getting destroyed that year. Like he had a team that was overrated and just got killed by West Virginia. And he's saying like, oh, I've been in the ACC for 12 years. I know the protocols or whatever. So it rubbed me the wrong way. I thought Clemson should forfeit. I don't know what their plans are, but he said that they, did, they followed the ACC rules and the ACC was ready to let them play. There's no way that they would have had the test, the retests. He did say that they offered to play Saturday or Sunday or Monday. A lot of schools are having finals right now. Do you really need the players out of the classroom a couple more days because... You didn't just wait a day? Like, I, I just don't understand. Matt, go ahead and, and give your thoughts on it because it, it is driving me nuts all weekend. Well, this was one of the first things that I thought about with it was when they talked about, like, they should have been able to play. There, was, there were all the signs that there was a positive player that was interacting. The, the, I heard an equivalent to this that I, that I really liked. It's like, if you know you're hosting Thanksgiving dinner at your house, and you know that one of the guests is, is going to be positive for COVID. Do you allow that person to come eat at your table? 
and potentially infect your family? No, you would never do that. It's the same principle that Florida State was following. They knew that there was that player that was testing positive. Why would you say, well, yeah, we have him isolated now. Let's go ahead and play anyway, because then what ends up happening? You play the game, and if a handful of Florida State's players get coronavirus, then it becomes, oh, well, how careless was Florida State that they played that game and let all those players get sick? They're, they're being careless and like completely spin the narrative away from it. And I think it's shame on, on the ACC as a whole that you you just allow Dabo to just continue to get on this podium and just badmouth the, the program that has carried your conference for the last three or four decades. Clem, Clemson's had three years recently where they've been relevant, and they're just going to allow Dabo just to get, continue to rub salt in the wound because Florida State's on a was on a downturn. You know, I, I'm curious to see how that that plays out when Norvell gets his recruits in and is able to turn things around. Because one of the issues was you see with Clemson is that when Jimbo Fisher was was on his way out, was pushing for the facility upgrades and the different things that that Clemson was being willing to put out or the, they were building to try to stay to keep up with the SEC schools. So as you're looking at that, Florida State didn't say cancel and don't make it up. But the issue then becomes they're saying, yeah, let's play it in December. If you're healthy, come play. Clemson's now trying to turn it into, oh, no, we want this to be at our field now. Well, why should Florida State be penalized? Because you didn't, you couldn't contain a player. And I think it would have been different had they have taken that single player and said, hey, he had potential symptoms. We quarantined him. We kept him away from the rest of the team. We tested him. He's positive. And you can tap that player out. It wasn't what? Two weeks ago, when Clemson played Notre Dame, three weeks ago, they had Trevor Lawrence, who was testing positive, on camera in front of America, like not wearing his mask and breathing on everyone. So it's like, how, how do you sit here and try to preach this? We, we follow the protocol. We have all this stuff. He had a player that was positive on the sideline. They're saying, oh, well, we're waiting for the, for some of those other tests to come back. It doesn't matter. If you have a positive, if you have a, a positive person, they're positive. It's so stupid. But, yeah, continue to badmouth Florida State like they're trying to shy away from the game. I was going to bring that exact example up because, and I even said at the beginning of the year, I think players and at least their families are going to take a look and they're going to learn a lot about how certain coaches handle this. Never did I imagine it would be this extreme where Clemson takes a player onto the sideline and, like you said, yeah, he might have been testing. He might have been negative during that game. But it's still a bad look. It's I know he's going to be a top draft pick. Put him in the box. Like I know maybe that's confined and they didn't want to do that. But like, why have him there on camera at all? And then now, let's see what happens because Miami's positive now. And just looking at like the Big Ten, the Big Ten's a mess. Wisconsin has to cancel first Minnesota. If they would have beat Northwestern, and of course Northwestern beat them. Maybe they, maybe they don't cancel this week. I don't know. But they don't, officially don't have enough games as of right now to play in the Big Ten championship game. So if Northwestern tumbles and Wisconsin like comes back, there's no way. Luckily for the Big Ten, Northwestern already beat them. Because now it's kind of like, oh, oh who cares? But they're very, they were dangerously close to having a situation where your best team in the West wasn't going to be able to make the Big Ten championship game. And so for Clemson, it's almost like, why, why push it? And so, like, they had two games built in. They already had their star quarterback out, and they're already using that as an excuse on why they lost to Notre Dame. All right, is this going to be another one? Because now I, I actually want to see this game played. Florida State hasn't looked good, but I think you have two options now. Clemson's either going to come out and run the score up like I expect Ohio State to do to Michigan this year for Harbaugh's uh, off-season shenanigans, calling out Ryan Day and trying to report him for whatever he did, like those recruiting violations or whatever, and Ryan Day said he's going to put up 100, there's no reason for me that to expect that not to happen. So it's going to be entertaining. Will I watch that game? Probably not. It's too embarrassing. Whenever, whenever you're seeing Michigan just not be able to make a stop, I'll probably watch it because just in case. It's one of the greatest upsets of all time. You never know. But Florida State could be doing the same thing. Could they pull off a big upset against Clemson? 
Because if Clemson loses, they're done. I don't think that, I mean, you're in a situation in the ACC, and let me just double check the standings because it's been low. But um, you're sitting there, and you're looking at it, and you have Notre Dame undefeated. Miami and Clemson are both one loss right now. Now, Miami has their own outbreak. I don't know what's going to happen. They postponed the game with Georgia Tech already. But they also play Wake and then UNC. So theoretically, if Clemson loses again, there's a good situation of at least a possible three-way tie if North Carolina beats Miami and Clemson and they all have two losses. Other than that, if Miami wins out, the ACC is going to be in a weird situation if Clemson gets that other loss because what are they going to do? I, do, I really don't think that Miami, if they somehow get into the ACC championship and beat Notre Dame, do you think they could compete against Alabama? They haven't recruited Possibly. as well. Possibly. I mean, I, I wouldn't knock them. I, I mean, I would say... I, I would say the same thing for like giving BYU a chance. Why not? I don't. I mean, I I look more, and maybe it's just the way that this this year has been because of coronavirus. I don't know that that there's there's a team that is outright on that level of like what LSU was last year, where you knew they were running into that buzzsaw. Like I think at times Clemson has shown vulnerability. I think there's times where. Alabama has shown vulnerability. You know, I don't know if Ohio State's played anyone with a pulse yet, so it's tough to tell where they're going to be. Matt, they played Indiana. Did you not see that? I think the big thing with that, <laughs> they had a gigantic lead and they blew it. If well, I was exactly. an Ohio State fan, I would look at that and I would say, I don't feel comfortable. Like, how is your defense not doing anything in the second half? Fields through a bunch of picks. And so, like, in Ohio State, you have to be thinking, all right, well, that that's not too – like, that's that's a bad look for us. Luckily, we got through it. But, like, what happens if – and I already said, like, okay, Northwestern right now is in the driver's seat in the West. What if they go undefeated? Like, would we have a playoff where you get in and Alabama just wins both their games by, like, 30 points because you're playing these teams that – in a normal year, they most likely wouldn't be playing because you have a shortened schedule. So instead of like Ohio State getting a loss and then still being able to make the playoffs, this year they're getting a loss, could be the Northwestern game, and they're out. Like I don't think you lose the championship game and then get in. And so like do they put a one-loss Northwestern in if that is the Ohio State stumble? Because look at it. They're running out. Their schedule's running out of time. They already have a forfeit. So if I'm playing devil's advocate, let's go. They're playing at Illinois, at Michigan State, two road games, and then you know that they're preparing their heart out for that Michigan game because they're going to run the score up. Their sleeper game is the championship game against like a Northwestern because they probably think, oh, we're going to crush these guys. And so normally Ohio State's been dropping at least one game every year, right? Yeah. So I don't think they're losing to Illinois. I don't think they're losing to Michigan or Michigan State. So their sleeper game is the Northwestern game this year. So if they drop it, they're done. Then the committee is going to have a question like, okay, what do we do with the Big Ten? Do we put Northwestern in? I think they were 100% ready to put Wisconsin in if they're able to get in. But now with that tiebreaker, Northwestern has to lose twice. They play at Michigan State who has looked awful. They play at Minnesota, who has, I mean, looked pretty bad. They got a win over um, Purdue, and then was it Purdue? And then they were calling like, oh, maybe the ref made the bad call. And so I don't know about that one. And then Illinois. I just don't see them losing two of those games. I think very easily Northwestern could be 8-0 playing Ohio State in that championship game. I mean, Indiana, they were close. They came back. If they don't throw, I think it was an interception on the last drive, and they try to get something going, like they should have just threw the ball up. Threw crossing guards. I don't know. But they lost by seven. So 
And the Big Ten could be out. If Northwestern loses and Ohio State loses that game and then you have one loss Northwestern, I would say personally, you know, I'm a fan of the Big Ten, keep them out. I would rather see BYU win. And so they released a college football playoff rankings, and that's why I'm talking about this. Northwestern is 8th. BYU is 14th. I think BYU is more exciting. I think I know that they played one tight game. The rest of their games are all blowouts. They were supposed to play Michigan State this year and I think a couple other um, Power 5 schools, but looking at those teams and how poor they are, I could argue that BYU would be undefeated no matter what this year. Add Michigan State on the schedule. Are they really losing to them? No. I mean, Michigan State has looked off. So, I mean, I, I would say that BYU is very similar to um, Indiana, at least with the passing offense, and they beat Michigan State 24 nothing. I know Indiana has a better defense, but, like, what are you really going to say? The other ones that stood out to me, Georgia at 9. Why? There's no way. Oklahoma at 11. Why are they ahead of BYU? And Iowa State, also ahead of BYU at 13. And I know they're keeping them there just because of the Big 12 championship game. The Big 12 should not make the playoff. If the Big 12 makes the playoff, I wouldn't be surprised if, if fans just boycotted it and didn't watch. Because Iowa State lost to a Sunbelt school. So if they went out and get in the playoffs, it's ridiculous. Because you're basically saying non-conference doesn't matter. When in previous years you were telling Penn State, like, oh, you, you lost a pit. We can't put you in. Like you, like, you got blown out by Michigan. Iowa State is no better. Same with Oklahoma. Like, there's no way they should even be close to the top 10. I know they're probably trying to get ready for bowl season, but I just don't know. The, the rankings look like complete crap to me. Texas is at 17. Like, they're really overvaluing the Big 12. And I don't know why. Do they forget that a lot of those schools lost to Sun Belt teams? Like, I don't see any other way around it. Well, I think you said it before. I think some of these guys, like, they're not actually watching any of these games. It's just like, oh, I remember that they used to be decent. And then like, that's where they're putting. Or it's like, I don't like this team, so I'm going to just put this other one ahead. Well, it's like, the same there's no thing reason with... that you need to have that many SEC teams that rank that high. Well, they're I think what needs to happen good. is it's the. It's like the the way social media and everything blew up, everything's so outdated, like it's new times. It's almost like if you remember the argument of when Nebraska and Michigan split the 1997, people were joking saying like Michigan got three of the big polls and Nebraska only got one, the coaches poll. And people just laughed because they were like, even Joe Paterno in Pennsylvania, they were saying like he doesn't even fill it out. So, like, everyone, at least in the Big Ten country, was like, yeah, Michigan definitely won the national championship. That poll is a joke. And then what happened? The B they added the BCS computers. I personally don't think they should have got rid of them. Because now you went to a time where, okay, they might have been overvaluing the SEC, but they, they gamed the system by playing less conference games and then scheduling cupcakes to get extra wins. Because the computer... Val valued wins. I think instead, what the NCAA should have said is that no, every conference has to play the same number of games. And they're still in imbalance right now. Like, I throw this season out, but the SEC and the ACC still only play eight games. I think if the NCAA, NCAA came in and said, look, we're trying to use a computer, but we need the data sets to be the same, all conferences have to play eight or nine games, whatever, 10. Some people are saying 10. Okay, I, I get it. If you're joining a conference, you want to play those teams, make it 10. I don't care. But I think if they were the same amount and you brought back the computers, it would be 100 times better than this list. Because you're going to look at it and they're going to say like, all right, BYU is putting, putting a show on. They're blowing everybody out. They should at least be top eight. Like you can't, or actually nine. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be behind Georgia. There's zero chance Georgia with two losses should be anywhere near the top 10. Same with some of these big 12 schools because you also have schools like Coastal Carolina 
Marshall that I think ever I think they're all still undefeated. And you're just throwing him in the end. At least with the BCS, it was fair saying, look, some of these schools they can't control their their scheduling. Like Cincinnati, undefeated. And why? Why penalize them? Why penalize them just to put in the Big Twelve schools that some writers that let's be honest, no one reads newspapers anymore. So like, why are they getting a vote? You could just pick some some guy. On uh, what's the what's one of the new social media apps TikTok that gets a million followers? People are more familiar with him than some uh, Big Twelve sports writer in Oklahoma. Let's be honest. So what's the difference? What is the difference? That's all I'm saying. Like you could just do what the All Star does for MLB. Just let the people vote. You'd get enough sample size to go through. There are enough bot protections and things now. They could basically partner with Google or IBM or Microsoft or some gigantic company to create like a computer pool, make fans one component, coaches keep the paper, whatever you want to do, and then that's it. But I definitely don't think it should be head coaches. I think it should be assistant coaches. And I think you should get like two from each school. And then that's it. Because I think you'd get a better sample set. More assistant coaches, because they have a better chance, I think, to look at it. And the head coach can pick who he wants voting. Well, here, I mean, I think a better route even is to look at the the undefeateds. If if you're undefeated, regardless of what conference you're in, there should be a heavier weight to what to what your ranking is, so that you don't have like like a team like Coastal Carolina. They're still gonna they're still gonna have other games that they they should still be. If you're undefeated, you should still be mathematically able to qualify for the playoff. And then if you end up losing a game and you're not a power five, if you want to knock them clear out of the, out of the top 25 altogether, like the coastal has to play Liberty at the end of the year. If Liberty beats them, then yeah, they have their loss. There's your justification that that you, you're not going to compete with those other ones, those other teams and take them out. No one would have an argument with that. But I think if they win out and they're undefeated, you're going to come back and you're going to have that issue with, well, how do you justify keeping them out as an undefeated team? They've they've won the games that they've played. And all it does is it sets the table that if you don't put them in the, the playoff because you think that they're not one of the four best teams, are you willing to give them part of that national championship if they play, you know, say uh, Florida or A&M that's on the outskirts right now? They play one of those types of teams and win, similar to what UCF did, where they thought, "Oh, we're just going to put that next that next SEC team played Auburn and beat Auburn," and then everyone got all up in arms and they said, "Well, we won all our games; we're national champions." And if they should prepared, claim it. And that's why prepared. I said that if because I have a feeling what's going to happen, they're going to throw in four teams, and like I hope the Big Twelve doesn't make it. Because at this point, it's just going to be a joke. Like, if you're going to throw in undefeated teams, that's fine. Throw Oregon or USC in. I know they both have only a handful of games, and they are both been playing close games. So do you really think they're going to be prepared for a playoff? No. That's why they should have just expanded it this year. They expanded it, but I think they were afraid that fans were going to like it, and then you're going to see, like, what if BYU did get in, and what if they beat Alabama? You couldn't go back to a 14 playoff after that next year. Or like, what if BYU played Notre Dame and beat them? The number two school undefeated from the ACC, because that, that's still on the table. And I think that the, the pollsters are just afraid because they're going to lose their power. Clemson, if Clemson uh, keeps losing games and they don't play enough or whatever, what if they're out? Because if it goes by win percentage, and I know that they lost to Miami, and I don't know if this is the case, Clemson with a with a postponed game, and if Miami is able to play all theirs, wouldn't Miami have the higher win percentage? Wouldn't they get in even though the head to head result is a loss? That's Possibly. why. I, that's why I'm thinking that they're calling for the whatever because you can't say, "Oh, we're going to play." Um, we're, we're like we don't, we're going to just count on like wins or whatever. But an eight and one squad. Versus seven and one squad, they would have a higher win percentage. So I don't really see how 
the ACC could say, well, those two things are the same because they're not. Like any other thing that's going to rank them, they would have Miami ahead. You only get to the head-to-head -head loss is if it's a tie. And maybe they wrote it up by it goes by the number of losses, but then like I don't see how that could work because like in – Wisconsin, going back to them, they're only two and one. They play like three games, so you couldn't just go by losses. That's why they had the game limit. And that's why I'm going back to this. Iowa State's ahead of Wisconsin. Wisconsin's two and one. They only lost to undefeated Northwestern, and they crushed Illinois and Michigan. Go back to that Iowa State squad. I know they have more games. Matt, they lost to a Sun Belt team. They lost to the University of Louisiana Raging Cajuns. Is that who that is that how the school was? Yeah, that's one of the their coaches. Matt, they the didn't just lose in the position to be to go to Michigan. It, they didn't just lose. Their third it was thirty one to fourteen. They lost by three scores. Yeah. Their coach is good. They'll be next to replace Harbs. Well, you know, that that was my another thing I, I didn't put on the list, but um I did want to get your feelings because right now, surprisingly I, I wasn't even going to talk about Michigan because if you want to hear my thoughts, just go back and listen to the previous episodes. But the game against Rutgers changed nothing. Harbaugh got backed into a corner. The backup quarterback came in again, looked 100 times better than the starting quarterback. So you're wondering, is he just not able to evaluate guys? Is he really only playing people that are working hard at practice? Like, does performance have nothing to do with it? And so we'll see on Saturday, is Michigan going to come out with Cade McNamara, who played outstanding in the two games that he got to play in this year? Is he going to be the starting quarterback? Because if not, Harbaugh's gone. The fans will riot. But an interesting spin on it, you're right. Matt Campbell has been mentioned as a replacement possibly for Harbaugh. He's also been mentioned, and this came out of left field to me, as a replacement for Scott Frost at Nebraska. Because Scott Frost has only been there for, this is his, what, third year? Right? Ooh, yeah. Did you even think he was on the hot seat? No. Because the, uh, the Iowa State, one of their fan sites actually responded to the rumors and said, like, Matt Campbell's not leaving Iowa State, which means... If one of their sites is po posting about it already, there's smoke there. So he must have been, I don't know if he'd been approached, probably just by boosters right now, or like some type of intermedium. But there, he's obviously been gauged on his interest. Maybe it was the Michigan job. I'm not saying that it was the Nebraska job. But for them to come out and try to like squash it already makes me think that there are rumors. And I, I mean, he's a good coach. Iowa State... Remember their last coach that was successful there, Matt? They even minted coins for him. The Chiswick coin, baby. He went to Auburn and won a national championship. <laughs> so you don't know. He only won one, and then he got chased out of town. But you know, he did get that one. This is what this is what I'm thinking. If they if they if Michigan does let Harbaugh go, I know who you, I know who they should hire, and they already have the personnel for it. They should bring Paul Johnson out. No. Yeah. To run the option, you, you could run the option at Michigan. It could be just like in 1941 when you were when you were really successful. You already have the big lineman. It would it would be a seamless transition, and you know that then you'd be able to compete with with the other teams. Well, I have been hearing some bad. Well, I don't know if it's bad news, depending on what side of the argument you're on. But they they have been compiling a list of how many players Michigan are playing without this year, and they're they're saying like. Look, it's not Harbaugh's fault that he's out with these 20 guys aren't playing this year. And he's he struggled out the gate because they didn't have any warm-up games. But that's not the issue. The issue is he can't evaluate quarterbacks. And in college, you need a quarterback to be successful. If every time your backup quarterback comes in the game, he looks better than the starter, like that's on the head coach. Like Dylan McCaffrey came in <laughs> against Notre Dame – on the road in Shea Patterson's first game, looked outstanding, was able to move the ball, the offense looked functional. Gets hurt next time he comes into the game, but he wasn't in the game like the next time anyway. Like he didn't even look like he was going to be the starter. Harbaugh was still undecided. 
So, like, flip to this year, Milton gets pulled against Wisconsin. Cade McNamara comes in in garbage time, looks successful, and you think, okay, that could be a fluke. I thought he should be starting the next game. Nope. It takes a 17 nothing hole for Harbaugh to feel like, you know what, maybe we should try that other guy. Leads him back to a win. It's like one of the biggest wins in Michigan history. Unfortunately, it's against Rutgers. But if he would have played the entire game, I don't think that game would have been close. I think Michigan wins by two scores in regulation. I know the defense is poor, so it'd probably be like 42 to 30 or something like that. But I think this week, if he comes out and Cade is not the starter, I think fans just go nuts. And then I think like Harbaugh has to go because you have to be able to know what talent is on your roster. And if you're honestly just going to pick a starter because they're practicing hard at this level, it doesn't matter. You're gone. And I wonder if that's why he's successful in the NFL. Like he goes there, the owner tells him who to play at quarterback. So he's kind of like, yeah, all right. And then because <laughs> at 49ers, with the 49ers, that was the biggest beef. He was, getting in, he was getting in trouble because he was always butting heads with the GM because he didn't like players that they were signing or whatever. And I think he needs that guy to kind of check and balance him. In college, you don't have that. Where, like with Stanford, his best years came with Andrew Luck. There was really no other choice for him, really, because of how good he was. He just lucked out. And Michigan, he's had choices. And he's made the worst one every time, it seemed, except for Wilton Spate. And unfortunately, he got hurt. And that's why I wonder, if he doesn't get hurt, is Harbaugh's entire thing different? They would still have to beat Ohio State. I don't know. He hasn't done it. And I think that would be the only thing that would save him this year. And there's absolutely nothing that I've seen that makes me think Ohio State is going to not going to be able to sc score at will. Don Brown's defense looks like complete trash. Like, he should be fired. They should have fired him immediately. I still think Don Brown should be fired right now. I know you're making a face, Matt. Rutgers went up 17-0 on that defense. They couldn't do anything. They can't stop them. They flipped to a zone. They're still pr playing press zone. Finally, at the end of the game, to get the game-winning interception in overtime, he finally put the safety deep over the top. Why doesn't he do that whenever teams are running the score up? <laughs> Like, your best player on defense is your safety. Why are you not using him? Like, that's your only chance right now, is to just go ahead, let the corners play back, have a safety play, play safety over the top, and then just say, guys, bend but don't break. Bend but don't break. It works for Iowa. I was, I was always wondering, like, if you had Kirk Ferentz at Michigan – he would be outstanding because he would finally have players that had like the extra talent that he doesn't get at Iowa. And whenever he does get a couple guys like NFL talents on his team, Iowa usually goes almost undefeated 10 or 11 win seasons. So if he had that every year with that, with that same defense, like Michigan doesn't need to run man defense. It doesn't work. Even Alabama can't stop Lane Kiffin from scoring. Just go to the bend, but don't break. Common sense. I, that's my end rant. You had to bring it up. But Scott Frost, going back to that, you think he's gone? No. I think they'll, they'll give him a little bit more time. I did some research, of... though. And guess who else is on the hot seat? Coach O. Coming off a national championship. Shut up. Because of the sexual assault <laughs> allegations. So you have a poor year where they're looking like garbage. He also has allegations coming out against him. Do you think, who do you think gets fired first, him or Scott Frost? I would say between both, I, I would want to say that Frost is probably going to get canned before Ogeron, but I, I think it just depends on what comes out legally. Because if there's, depending on what comes down the pike legally, they'll the university will cut ties just to, to save face. Also, just so you know, LSU is three and three. Um, Michigan is what's our right? Two and three. So you're looking at teams that are firing their coaches for going almost 500. And yet no one's talking 
about Penn State 0-5. Like, no one's even mentioning James Franklin, who also has his same issues. It's like, are people not caring? I saw ESPN put up a list of, like, the most embarrassing perform team performances this year, and they had Michigan at number one. And I'm like, they still have one game. They had Penn State at number two. I was thinking, like, what did you see at Penn State that made you think, oh, Michigan's the worst team this year? I mean, they play each other this Saturday, so what's your pick? Oh, I think Michigan's going to win. <laughs> but you don't know who's quarterback for us, baby. If we get down 17 nothing, we might not be able to, to score on Penn State enough. If you get down 17 nothing, then you should be embarrassed. Tell your man Don Brown. When you when he got hired, he was he was a blitzing aggressive defensive coordinator. He's not going to change. Well, and, some of it's on him though because he did well when he had athletes. He's not a good recruiter. So at some point you have to be like, all right, we got to cut ties with you now. You either have to recruit guys that work in your defense, or if you're only recruiting safeties, and then you're converting them to to cornerbacks, it doesn't work. Man. As you can see from Michigan's defense, it doesn't work. You got to recruit guys to play your scheme. Well, maybe it, maybe it doesn't work when you you have all of the guys that you're banking on opting out. True, but we don't know. We'll see if the if the band's back together again next year. I I like I wonder how many people would even watch that. But you think Michigan beats Penn State? They should, they should absolutely, from what I've watched of Penn State, they should absolutely throttle them. That makes you, that, that makes you wrong. Michigan's going to, well, they're at home, so I could be wrong on this. Because if it was at Penn State, I know Michigan would be down 17 nothing just like a Rutgers, and it would be game <laughs> over. But it's at home, and Penn State usually does the same thing on the road. Like, they let Michigan get a big lead, and next thing you know, it's 42-3 to because to uh, James Franklin's settling for a field goal in the third quarter. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> That's usually how it's gone. But if Penn State can't beat Michigan, I I'm looking at their schedule. They they have to beat Michigan State or Rutgers to get a win. I mean, they could very easily, if they beat Michigan, they could finish with a better record than Michigan at three and whatever, at three and five. Michigan could would be two and six. Because I don't I don't know if they're gonna beat Maryland. And then of course they're not gonna beat Ohio State. So that's my last thing. I think the college football playoff rankings are a joke for college. Um, it's unfortunate. I know we went super long on college football today, but they dropped that. And then the Dabo thing, it still annoys me. He also threw Pitt under the bus by saying that Pitt had a positive test um, before the test and they, st or before the game, and they still flew down and played Florida State. But what I didn't see, the difference is, I don't know if that player traveled with the team. He didn't. That, that's the big issue. So if you're sick and you're practicing, that's fine. If you test everyone on Friday, because what happens, what, what's supposed to happen? They're supposed to do like three tests a week. So they're testing the guy throughout the week. Even if he's sick, they're supposed to kind of keep him quarantined, which I, I would imagine the Clemson staff did. That's kind of what Dabo said was like, look, you're, you're questioning our medical staff. We have the protocols. But once <laughs> you travel... We take giving everyone Osterine. Yeah, but you're at you're your practice. Everyone separate. I understand that. But once you're traveling, you're in a tight space with other people. So I'm going to wonder, and so we'll see how good Clemson's staff is. Are they going to have more positive tests this week? I mean, they, they haven't had to uh, report it, right, because the Florida State game's canceled. Or was that last week? They play, what's the dates? No, they play Pitt this week. Yeah, I'm right. So we'll find out if they have people missing this weekend or not. Because like if it turns out that Clemson missed like 10 people, then Florida State's 100% in the right. But no one's asking the questions. They're just letting Dabo talk about it and then call them out. Yeah. So And just like, oh, just kick, kick rocks on Florida State. So that's my big thing. All right. Anything else you got for college? No. I know. I said I wasn't going to talk about Harbaugh and I went super long on it, but whatever. You turn into the show because you love it. Steelers now, baby. Undefeated. The Jaguars, I don't know if I predicted a win. I think I've just been predicting Steeler wins because they're undefeated. And uh, at this point, I'm not putting it past them. But I will say this. I didn't expect them to dominate the Jaguars like they did. I know you, you said about 
Minshew being hurt and the Jaguars not being themselves. But the Steelers' defense, missing key players, they've been solid. They even did a Mac like call out. Speaking of college football, since we did that first, did you see that on the broadcast? I don't know if it was just down here, but they did like a highlight of all the Steelers players from the Mac conference talking about like how the conference needs more respect. Like, um, <laughs> Johnson, the, one of the linebackers, I forget, like I forget going through the whole team, but there was like four or five of them. I was like, Holy crap. I guess they do draft a lot of Mac. I mean, Roethlisberger would be the biggest one out of Michigan or not Michigan out of Miami, Ohio. So just crazy that they're able to scout locally. And to be honest, if I was the Big Ten, because you always hear about like the SEC doing this, that's what I would be promoting is you're recruiting to play in a conference where they have a crap ton of NFL teams. There aren't that many NFL teams in SEC country. Like you're, if you play at Ohio State or at Michigan, there's NFL teams all around you, even Penn, Penn State. Like you're going to have the Ravens right there. You have the Steelers. You have the... The Eagles, you can go up to see the Bills. You have the Browns, Cincinnati, Detroit. Like, they're all right there. Like, you don't have that in the SEC. You play in Alabama, there are no NFL teams right next door. So, like, if I was the Big Ten and I was the MAC, I would 100% be using that as a recruiting tool. And maybe they are, but I haven't seen it. But I think that that would be a huge selling point as people say, like, oh, it means more down here. It's like, you know what? If you're not the best player, your team's having a bad year, you could still get drafted because there are a crap ton of teams that watch you play all the time. Like it's much easier for a scout to just <laughs> go see a pit game because the Steelers are there than to go see, um, like fly down and go see them play like Auburn or something. So that's my other unconnected rant. But looking at the Steelers, they're playing the Ravens on Thanksgiving. I think they win it. The Ravens are starting to flounder. Very hardball like Although he's not having quarterback problems like his brother. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, on the flip side, he's having running back problems. Yeah, but I'm concerned because I did see a stat where Harbaugh has a better head-to-head record over Mike Tomlin. And so I was thinking, like, all right, this is a good year to catch up on him. Steelers are undefeated. Ben, every time he gets dinged up in the game, I mean, I'm used to it for the past 10 years. He's always limping around and stuff. But you're getting old. So if you could stop that, that'd be great. Like, quit limping around on the field, making me nervous because it's only one injury away from ruining this entire season. And it just shows you that Mason Rudolph isn't the answer. He had this team, and they did what last year? Missed the playoffs? So this, I was worried about the Ravens game coming in. That was a few weeks ago, a couple blowout wins ago. That was like the close Cowboys win. So now, Ravens are trending down, Steelers are trending up. I got the Steelers. What do you say? I think because of all the running backs being gone, and for as run-centric as Baltimore is, I think that it gives Pittsburgh the the advantage. However, I'm, I'm curious to see if they actually do get to play the game. Because there's talk of possibly postponing if, if there's more there's more injur- there's more people being out for Baltimore. Because of injuries or because of coronavirus? Because of coronavirus. Ugh. Steelers right now are five and a half favorite. And let's be honest, in terms of the standings and stuff, if Steelers win, the Browns are going to be right there for a better seed. Like Baltimore's getting ready to have to play potentially the Chiefs in the first round. Like that would be like a couple weeks ago or even at the beginning of the year, that would have been mind blowing. But whenever you're looking at the playoffs, you're thinking, okay, right now the Steelers have the bye. The Ravens would be out. If they get in, they're matched up against the Chiefs. Like they'd be tied with the Ravens or the Raiders and the Dolphins. And a couple weeks ago, I said, like, I the Dolphins I think are pretenders. And I think they proved that with their little quarterback shenanigans in the last game against the, the Broncos because the Broncos aren't good. And two, I know you, he doesn't have enough reading, like experience on the defenses like Fitzpatrick does, but you put in Fitzpatrick, 
he's still making bonehead plays. It's like, why are you flipping quarterbacks? Mm. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you trying to get the win, and then if he would have led them to a win, then what? Like he didn't win them, to lead them to a win. Uh, Tua was looking like he was pumped up, like trying to help him out. And I was like, that's just a weird situation. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Dolphins were one of the teams to miss. And then it comes down to Gruden versus the Ravens. So they're in a situation, like I said, where if the Steelers can beat them, they might not have to worry about them. So it would be perfect. So that's my thing. Um, in the AFC, I think other than that, it's pretty clear. Chiefs got a big win against the Raiders, and that separated them. It's a short Thanksgiving week, so we'll be right back into it in terms of the AFC things. But I will say, other than like the Raiders versus Ravens and possibly the Dolphins, who I think are going to be out of it, I don't know if we're going to see a lot of drama down the stretch. Like, could the Dolphins beat the Bills for the division? Like, I don't think so. You have the AFC South, which just could be a toss-up. I don't know. But just around the AFC, you have anything going into Thanksgiving week? Um, not too much. I just want to see how teams are going to handle um, some of the COVID warnings because you're seeing more players that are, are starting to, to test positive. And I'm wondering if that has part to, to do with the earlier part of the season where we saw some, some players being out and then kind of just going into these waves. And, I mean, the heavy flu season really doesn't start till December, I think. And so you're going to be hitting it hard. And that's why I've always said, like, I, not just in the NFL, but even, like, college football too it's like why would you start later like i thought the nfl what they should have done is since they cut the preseason just start two weeks earlier like split the difference and give yourself an extra bye week in case something happened because now you're running up against whatever i mean i've thrown out some extreme plans on this show including just doing divisional games or whatever uh but i would say the easiest and I know it's in retrospect now, would have been play early. Like you're cutting out these games and why? Because you're waiting for the protocols. I even had something come up in my timeline today about a, uh, a potential football mask that was pitched back in the summer that had like a, a ventilator type thing built in. And then of course, when you're running around, it doesn't work because you're just going to be harming your lungs and you don't want a player to get hurt by it. So, I mean, just looking back, it's like, okay, you gave your, you did yourself no favors now. So getting into it, and in, in terms of fantasy football, which we're going to get into here in a little bit, they're kind of really just stuck, their fans, because you don't know what's going to happen. And like you said, it could throw things completely sideways. Like, would it be outside the realm of like a couple teams in the AFC East getting hit with players that have to sit out and the Patriots make a run? Because right now you're looking at the Patriots that aren't going to make it. A lot of people are going to be happy about that. And maybe just unexpected players being unavailable is going to swing that back. I don't know. So I got anything, anything else for the AFC? No. All right, getting into the NFC stuff. Um, I'm going to start off because it's not on the board. I don't want to forget to bring it up. Thanksgiving, I, I've always hated it in terms of NFL scheduling for a while. I don't think I've ever brought it up on the show or even told you. But I have to talk about it this year. Like the Thanksgiving games, there's nothing going on right now in the world. And you would think like, okay, Thanksgiving, finally we can have a full weekend of football. I know Michigan doesn't play Ohio State this weekend, so it's not the same feel. But why, oh why, are the Cowboys and the Lions still forced to play on Thanksgiving? Like, both franchises are complete crap. And I know it's tradition or whatever where they're like, well, you have to watch this bad Lions team play. And in the past, and I'm talking about in the past, like when I was a kid, 
you at least got to watch the Cowboys play and they were a playoff team. And you could see some good football in the NFC East. But you're watching two games that mean absolutely nothing. Texans and the Lions, three and seven versus four and six. And then you have Washington at Dallas, three and seven and three and seven. Why? Why are those highlighted on your biggest holiday schedule? Like they should just get together and say, okay, like Lions, I don't, maybe it sells you merchandise, but you're not doing yourself any favor playing on Thanksgiving anymore. It's just an embarrassment. And same with the Cowboys. It's like, we get to watch you, what, squeak one out versus Washington. Is anyone going to be excited about that and say, you know what, I'm going to go buy a Cowboy shirt. Because I would assume that that's why they don't want to give them up because the owners have like dibs on them for the TV money. But I think they split a lot of the TV money anyway, so it just comes out the merchandising stuff. I hate it. Luckily, they, they got a, a good matchup with the Ravens and Steelers. Like, just put... I don't even know. Like, you couldn't even put... If you're going to do it, make it a rivalry game. Make the Lions play the Packers or the Bears every year. Why have them play the Texans? I mean, they're kind of doing that with the Cowboys and the Redskins, but why? It's just so bad, and I well, hate that it. conference is so wide open that everyone has a crap team, so they equal, they all have an equal shot at winning the conference, so you're fine. Matt, but they could flex in so many other different, better games on that week, and let me just look and see because I'll probably just making stuff up. I mean, even if you're just flexing in games – you have an intriguing Cardinals and Patriots matchup that people would watch. Like, I know the Patriots are, have a losing record, but the Cardinals, people still want to know if they're pretenders or not. Flex that in for the afternoon game. I don't want to watch the Cowboys. Or actually, get rid of that first one. Put the Cowboys one at noon while everyone's eating. If it's no. for that division and you know, well, that no. division's crap. No, no. Detroit gets to play. Why? Because they're Detroit and they took that crap game when nobody else wanted it. So you know what? You get to keep it. But it's so bad. You could have... It's, the, it's their day. And they play well. This is a great week that when you're... If you're a Matt Stafford fantasy owner, he'll go off for four touchdowns this week and then be absolute turd the rest of the year. But I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, maybe the schedule works out because they can have the game of the week on the afternoon, Chiefs versus Bucks. And then you have the Sunday night Bears versus Packers, Monday night Seahawks versus Eagles. Okay. But like there are so many other games like 49ers and Rams, more intriguing. I'd rather watch that than the Cowboys Redskins game. So you don't, don't want to watch Riverboat Ron? No. I mean, Saints and uh, the Broncos. My big thing, before I forget though, Tom Brady. They're playing the Chiefs. He just threw the game away last week to the Rams. It's not even last week, last night. He threw it away. I don't know what he is doing. My man Antonio Brown could have so many more fantasy points for me if Tom Brady would just be able to throw a deep ball. So I'm <laughs> hoping that Tom Brady just calms down. You're making the right reads, man. I know you're getting old. Maybe you need a week off. But, man, did you play bad? I think in they have four losses. I would say you could blame at least two of them on Tom Brady. The Bears won where they lost 20 to 19. And, um, I mean, the other two losses were to the Saints. And then, of course, last night where they had that. I mean, the first one, Tom Brady with the Bears, he was 25 for 41. Like he's missing like almost half his throws. And he only had one touchdown. And they had a lead, but they just couldn't get anything at the end of the game to come in and get a field goal. Like, it wasn't Tom Terrific coming out there. They had a minute to come down and do something. This time, against the Rams, same situation. He throws an interception. So, keep an eye on him. I hope the Buccaneers can get it out, but that's a big game against the Chiefs. Who do you have in that one? Got to go with the butt. Got to go with the chef. Why? Because they're nine and one. Yeah, it's a safe. It's a safe bet, and I have no confidence in 
in uh, Brady's ability to operate Arians' offense. But I don't even know if it's the offense. I just think that the I think the timing's off because there were a lot of plays where he had guys open and he was just overthrowing them a little bit. Or he was underthrowing them, like it looked like they were supposed to be in a little bit different spot, or at least he thought they were. And so, it's to the point where I could see the Buccaneers like which team shows up is how good they're going to be, and it becomes a question of just time. Well, that's part of it, but I think there's also part of it that how much how much are you forcing on them because. He, it, it's not like Brady was known for consistently throwing all of these interceptions. Well, so it's, it's not a, even I, like I still think if he had, and he's never really had the receivers like this to stretch the field either. Like he didn't even have a team with like two great receivers on it at the same time. He's only had like one guy. Like he had like a pasta prime Ocho Seco. He had like a pasta prime Randy Moss. And then his other guys were kind of just journeymen that a lot of people don't even remember. I think the early teams where they had uh, a couple of the good combo receivers that were just like savvy vets, that's what he needed. And now he actually has a couple deep threats. Like Mike Evans can go deep. Antonio Brown can go deep. It's like, man. And then even just having like the, I mean, he's been defeating the tight end braid a good bit. Plus, you got the slot receivers and stuff. It's just a great offense for him to be in. Now he just needs to get the timing down. And if he, they do, I mean, it's just going to be a dangerous team. Plus, the other thing is um, Drew Brees. Out with broken ribs. They keep getting new ones, Matt, as the swelling goes down. So, is he even back in time for playoffs? He had like a collapsed lung or punctured lung or whatever. I mean, he was banged up, and it, I think part of it just depends on what what they do with their quarterback situation. Because if they keep if they keep if Taysom Hill keeps doing what he's doing, you don't have to force the issue. Well, here's my thing. I have it on the topic list. ESPN and uh, was it DraftKings or Fanduel? They were under fire for Taysom Hill because they let him play as a tight end in fantasy over the weekend. And so, you know me, I'm the commissioner. I just let it go because I don't make that decision. I'm like Pontius Pilate. I just wash my hands of it. If ESPN wants him to play as a kicker, go for it. Like, that's up to them. You can go ahead to the worldwide leader and throw your complaints at them. And so, of course, I tried to bid on him because I thought, oh, this is a great chance for me. I need this. I was only one of two people to bid on him. And, of course, I got outbid. And the team that did win him, Played him at tight end and lost. So karma was out to get him. I won my matchup, of course, you know, keeping my lead on you for the playoff spot. But I will say this. I don't understand why ESPN couldn't flip it. They were saying, oh, well, it came too late in the week and whatever. I, I just don't understand that logic. Like, are people going to be playing? Because my thought was, People that watch the leagues and actually know what's going on and even care about it, they're going to know that they need to make a new pick. He wasn't even rostered. I mean, it wasn't even like the guy had him on the bench, man. In most leagues, no one even owned him. Because we have one of the bigger leagues, and they're always telling us, like, oh, pick up this receiver. when well, he's been on a team for the entire year because you have to have more spots if you're in a bigger league. So on one hand, I don't even know why anyone would have Taysom Hill on your team to begin with because he only gets a touchdown or he's a bust. So ESPN could have easily flipped that switch and said, look, we know that no one had him on their team, so we're just going to go ahead and flip that. If you were starting him as your tight end and then um, it flicked it or whatever, because what they did this week now, they changed it. So he's stuck in your tight end. You can roll with it, which is what I think they should have done last week. Because you could roll with it, but if you need to make a roster change, let's say another guy's on a bye week, you can't touch your lineup for the rest of the year. Which, of course, you would lose. Because <laughs> one guy gets hurt or whatever, and you're just like, no, i got to keep Hill in as my tight end. 
because <laughs> I need those extra points or whatever. He'd even have the most points on the week because uh, they still have Kelsey, which I would even argue could be a bigger beef for people because he plays most of his snaps standing up as a wide receiver. So why is he even eligible for tight end then? So, like, a lot of fantasy people are getting mad. There's one clear tight end, and if you're in a daily draft league or whatever, pick him. Pick him. Because he's the number one tight end, he has the most points, and he gets the most looks because he plays as a wide receiver. So, that's my last day. I know he was under fire for the decision. I think they could have easily switched it and just locked the lineup then. That way, if the owner said, you know what, I didn't know this, but now I'm going to keep him in. Someone gets called out because coronavirus, they can't replace him. Very simple. Very simple. So yeah, I don't think he's going to be the answer, though, Matt. Because I've said once a quarterback gets a couple games under his belt in with some film on how they're going to use him, he's going to be shut down. Like there's a reason he hasn't really thrown the ball. Luckily, they play the Broncos. Then they play the Falcons, and the Eagles. So they get three weeks of them. Hopefully they can get Drew Brees back before the Chiefs game because I think the Chiefs will really exploit them. But we'll see. They're on the road for all three, by the way, which could also play a factor. Um, but anything else plus you got the, for the NFL or on the NFC well, side? Well, plus with the Saints have Jameis as a wild card too, that if, if they start – if Hill starts to struggle, they still have – a proven starting NFL quarterback that they can play instead of a tight end at quarterback. Matt, unless Jim Harbaugh is their coach, like they had to have seen something in him that made them decide to go with Hill. Like if, if it was a Harbaugh move and they were just saying, you know what? Hill's just been working so hard at the quarterback position, we've got to give him that call. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think Sean Payton's doing that, Matt. <laughs> so I don't think I don't think Jameis is going to come in and do any better. I think they realized, like, oh, now we know why the Steelers didn't want him. So. <laughs> I'd love to see, because they're not playing him, keeping his his free agency value down and having Pittsburgh sign him. But why? Why? Because he's essentially the same mold as Roethlisberger, only younger. Let him back air, let him throw the ball deep, let him run around. I don't know. He doesn't win, though. You don't know. You need a winner. Yeah, look at what Tom Brady's doing with Tampa, throwing interceptions, just like Jameis. What's the time stamp on this? An hour in? An hour six? Because I'm going to go back to this whenever you're saying, uh, after his Super Bowl celebration, you're like, I don't know how Tom Brady won that game. They were down 30 points in the game, and he let them back in the Super Bowl. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that. They win the Super Bowl. I'll tell you exactly how it is because as soon as they signed Tom Brady, what did they do? They went out and bought every single free agent like it was like they were on Madden and got him a running back and they got him two wide receivers and they brought Gronk out of retirement and they they loaded with all of these additional guys. Who Jameis have? He had a he had dropsies Mike Evans. <laughs> Done. I, I know now Mike Evans isn't even dropping the ball because Tom Brady just not throwing it to him. There was one. It was like an out pattern or something. I can't remember. But it was a high throw, and I thought, oh, well, there's no way he's catching this. And he jumped up and caught it, and I was like, oh, my gosh, what happened to Mike Evans? I didn't know who it was at first. I'm like, is that Gronk? Oh, no, that's still Mike Evans. I expected him to drop it. Colin Brady was a little bit off on it. But we'll see. Because I could see them losing to the Chiefs. Then they play the Vikings, Falcons, Lions, Falcons. So they have a good schedule to just get everybody on the same page and start to have their offense clicking heading into the playoffs. So if they lose this one, they'll be 7-5. and five. And, of course, the NFC playoff situation, like you brought up, because I forgot to mention it, it is totally different because of the NFC East. So you got to be really careful because right now the Bucs, they're going to be fighting for that last spot with the Cardinals if they lose. And, or no, with the Bears, the Bears are 5-5, five five, actually. I keep forgetting that they keep expanding it. So, maybe they'll be comfortably in. I don't know. They'll be 7-5. and five. The, the Bears are game short, it looks like. Or did they already have their bye week? I don't know. 
I'm not sure what the difference is in games there, why the Bears have one loss. I can't remember. Do they have to postpone a game? I don't know. Possibly. Yeah, because I don't see a buy on Tampa Bay's schedule, though. Maybe I'm just missing it. Maybe Tampa Bay does have another buy. Oh, no, they might have one. This Chiefs game might be their game before their buy. I also forget that there's third week 13 buy this year for whatever reason. The NFL just decided to throw everything out that you're used to, and you know they're like, you know what? We're going to have 13 bye weeks just to screw fantasy commissioners. Because then I'm like, well, you can't have a buy in the playoffs. And if you, if you, then if you try to go too early or too late, then you don't know. And then if they cancel the last two weeks, then your championship game is going to be canceled. So for people that are curious, if you're still listening to this, what we're doing is your playoffs, that's it. So if you get the playoff, whoever has the most points is our tiebreaker. So the playoffs, if there's going to be, I think we have, what, eight teams in? People wanted a large playoff this year. So there will be four winners after that first week. Whoever has the highest points, if the season's called from that week, they'll be the champion. So we're not having a four-way tie or anything. One winner, one champion. That's how we're handling i got to figure out, write out the rest of my tiebreakers as we get into that situation. Because I have a feeling that if the NFL does something dumb, it's going to be canceling the last two weeks of the year, which is our championship in fantasy. So I really hope not, but I have a feeling that if they do, that's when they would cut it off. Give themselves two weeks and then just have the expanded 18 playoff. But that's my fear. you have anything else for the NFL? Nope. All right, going into the final bell, I have one thing. College basketball is about to start up. And we talked about college hockey's been playing. And everyone keeps talking about football this, football that, with all the coronavirus stuff. Why does college basketball have to start right now? Like, I don't understand it. Like, the Pac-12 because was supposed to start in January. They could easily do what college football did and just wait. Wait till the kids come back. Because now you're having extra basketball players on campus that have to stick around now while everyone else is going to go home. So they're going to be safe. Well, I guess you could look at it that way. I mean, I guess there would be less people for basketball. But um, I have some great numbers here. Because we're on the Big Ten, or at least uh, we get Big Ten alerts now for coronavirus. So we have women's basketball supposed to start. And how many of them are out? There is a good. There is a couple of them. Wisconsin women's basketball, they postponed their opener because of coronavirus. I want to say there was someone else. Um, oh, wait, Purdue's, that was Purdue's defensive end. George Carp... Carla Fittis, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. He's like their main NFL, or not recruit, but their NFL prospect. He had a test, so he's in isolation. And so with basketball, there's a bunch of these that are getting held out and pushed back. Like, why? Why? Um, there's an advisory for Ohio State, but it looks like they're having it with a password, so I didn't watch it. I'll have to look and see. Maybe next week we'll start to bring in stuff like that. But we got some inside stuff right from the schools. So we'll be able to keep an eye on them and see what actually is going to play this year and what's not. And I still wonder, you can't complain about football if your school is getting ready to start a bunch of other sports. Why? So that's my final bell. You have anything else for the final bell? Nope. All right. Go to southboundsports.com. Check out our stuff. I need to do a better job of plugging it. Like I said, if there's anything you want us to hit on, um, it's a big year for the Steelers. I know downloads have been starting to pick back up in a big way. So thanks for everyone coming back to listen to the show. And if there's any new listeners, thanks for you too. Um, we'll be getting into it with a lot of football stuff coming up. I know normally we're getting ready for bowl season and stuff. It's weird. You'd have the, the big playoff announcement in like two weeks. Now it's like weeks out. And same with the NFL stuff. Games getting postponed or canceled. I don't know. But we'll, we'll be doing it every Tuesday. So check back out. Go to southboundsports.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.